After stress testing Shreddy 4 with the most indestructible object in the world and losing, we hit the drawing board again to make our final and most powerful desktop shredder that we've ever engineered. We then went a step further and fired up this 2 horsepower beast using nothing but the sun. This harvested clean energy was the perfect way to recycle all the junk boxes we accumulated into what could be perfect cat litter or better yet home insulation if our experiments to make it fireproof work out. Of course, cardboard is not ideal insulation since it can also attract pests and is vulnerable to moisture damage. But subscribe, like, and keep watching to find out how far we got. We started by opening up a brand new Shreddy 5 kit, and the kit assembly is very simple. With all the parts laid out, we begin by inserting all the blades and spacers on the shafts in an alternating order. Once done, we set that aside and prepare the gearboxes and motor assembly by mounting the side plate with four screws. We then slide the assembled shaft into the gearbox along with a bearing to ensure smooth rotations of the shaft. We repeat this exact process for the other half and then slide them into place. It's important that the blades align perfectly so we take a moment to ensure that it's properly done. It looks good so we can mount the side plates and lastly we pop on the top cover. That's it! Now we just secure it all with four screws and Shreddy is ready to go. Our insulation test is coming soon so stay tuned, but first let's show you how we set up this experiment. For the past year we've been collecting tons of cardboard boxes just for this video. As you can see, we turned our backyard into a junkyard because this project, using solar panels, will require the sun and therefore be conducted outside. Before we're able to shred these boxes, we need to cut them into thin strips. Alan will be using the automatic cutter, while Dave is stuck with the classic utility knife. It's important that these strips are thin enough to fit into the shredder blades. These look good, so let's get to work and cut all the boxes. We've sped up this process, but surprisingly it didn't take as long as we thought. And before we knew it, we were in the final stages of cutting the last cardboard boxes. With that all done, it was time to head over to Harbor Freight to buy solar panels. We were told that the solar panels were in aisle 3, and surely enough, there they were. These are 100 watt panels and are exactly what we need for this project. So we grabbed as many as we could and headed back home. Setting them up is really simple. In total, we needed 15 panels for this project, which gives us a total power output of about 1500 watts. Now, buying all this equipment is very expensive, and we get comments like, how do we make enough money to fund these projects? Well, the answer is very simple. As a bigger channel, companies reach out to us offering money in exchange for an ad. And this is a great way of making money. But unless you're already popular, it's hard to secure these sponsorships. We were recently invited to try out a new and totally free platform that benefits everyone, literally. As long as you have a YouTube or Instagram account, you can use Bix to make a passive income. At Bix.co, as a content creator, you can set up a profile, list your prices for a video, a post, whatever it is, and businesses will reach out to sponsor you. And as a small business, you can easily find influencers to collaborate with and promote your brand at any budget. We got to test Bix behind the scenes and we're super excited for the official launch later this year. If you're interested, join the waitlist at Bix.co to get notified as soon as it launches. But till then, we have a solar farm to get back to. With our mini solar farm assembled, it's time to bring out Shreddy. But before we can power it up, we need to set up the electrical components and measure what voltage we can get from these panels. To do this, we use four of these solar connectors because they're each rated to 400 watts, and we connect four panels per adapter. The connections are all the same SAE style plug, which is a style I really appreciate for outdoor DC equipment. We now have 400 watts of power at our output port, which means that we need extension wires. The right side connects to our output port on the adapter, and the other side is used to power Shreddy. For a better visual, here's what the setup looks like from the back of the solar panels. All right, we're ready to connect some power to Shreddy. We grab our voltmeter and start by checking that each of our four adapters is putting out roughly 21 volts under the strong sunlight. As you may have guessed though, as clouds pass across the sky, they block the direct sunlight, which reduces our voltage significantly from 21 volts to just 13 volts. To solve this, we headed over to Walmart to buy a car battery. 
Great, we have our battery, but how are we supposed to charge a 12 volt battery with a fluctuating 21 volt power source from the solar panels? Well, for that we need a solar charger, or in other words, a voltage regulator that can accept variable input voltage, which is what we get from our solar panels, and will output a constant 12 volt DC to charge the battery. For our last piece of the equation, we bring in a car inverter. This is the common device used in cars to convert the 12 volt auxiliary power outlet to a 110 volt AC outlet. Now that we sorted that out, we can bring all of the components outside and properly connect them to our solar panels. With Shreddy fully set up, we're ready to grab our cardboard strips and turn them into cardboard insulation. We'll also throw a plastic bin under the shredder to collect all the shredded bits and make some room for Dave and I to sit. The first thing we do before powering any machine up is safety first. So let's get our safety glasses on and get to work. Now, before we power on this machine, we want to make sure that we have another level of mechanical safety. So these are 3D printed guides that are used for whatever shape you're trying to push into Shreddy. This one here is for bottles, but this time we're doing cardboard. We bolt the safety guard into place and power Shreddy on. This is incredible. You are now seeing Shreddy work purely on solar power. With everything functioning as intended, we got straight to work and shredded some cardboard. Now, as you can imagine, this was also a long process, so we've sped up the video, but this made for some great brotherly bonding time. You can see the bin is starting to fill up, which is exactly what we want for this project. The sun is great for our solar panels, but not so much for our skin, so Dave made sure to get us our action box hats. That's what older brothers are for. Here's a close-up shot of the shreds. You can see that we've programmed the shredder to have a backward spinning cycle to clean out the blades from any excess shreds that may be stuck inside. This worked wonders. The shreds are small and extremely consistent. We couldn't be happier with these results. With the tub completely full, our first batch is ready to be bagged for our insulation test later in this video. We're hoping to get as many bags as we can filled up, as we've got quite a big garage attic to insulate. So with our first one done, we immediately move on to the next. This process continued until all the cardboard strips were shredded. We had to work quickly to ensure we didn't lose the sun, and overall we were quite efficient. Bag number two. These are really great samples for our insulation test. All right, we're down to our last box. Let's go. We're all done here. I can see the shadow from the house is creeping up on us. So let's get these all packed up and start insulating. This entire process was definitely the longest part of the experiment, but we were both super excited for what's to come next. It was now time to disassemble the solar farm, including the electrical parts, bring Shreddy inside, and get straight to work on setting up the insulation test. The first step is to 3D print our experiment's enclosure. We used an FDM printer and the print quality was set to a 0.2mm layer thickness. This ensures high quality parts and the supports just came right off. So let's explain how this all comes together. We're going to fill this area with plaster and then we're going to put a heating source in here and close it up. Then we're going to put two thermocouples in here. The thermocouples screw in nicely and are really easy to work with. We then insert our custom insulation. As the heat comes out here to here, this thermocouple should read colder than this one. When we assembled all of these components, we realized that we coincidentally made the flag of France. What we're also going to do is put some store-bought insulation in there with a known R value of around 3. We repeated the same steps for the other side and used a utility knife to cut out the perfect square for our part. It fits right in, so now it's time to insulate this entire section. To do this, we headed over to our local hardware store to buy plaster of Paris. Now this here is going to be our heating chamber. Since we don't want any of the heat to escape through the sides, we'll be using the plaster as insulation. We gradually added the plaster and water, and gave it a good manual mix. Once most of the lumps were eliminated, we used a funnel to fill the cavity and spread around the mixture to ensure an even distribution. We need it filled to the very top, and once done, we can use our finger to level off any areas that may be lacking mixture. And now we wait around 30 minutes for the plaster to cure, and once hardened, we get this really solid piece and we're ready to set this experiment up. We begin by screwing in our 40 watt light bulb to the socket and giving it a quick test. 
It's looking nice and bright, so we can move on to closing the box. Effectively, we want to measure the temperature difference between this side and this side, so let's go ahead and connect the electronic components. We're going to use these PID temperature controllers from Injecto. Note that it's hard to read the numbers due to the frequency of the camera shutter, but if I pause this right when it flickers on, you can see that it's reading 24 degrees Celsius, which is correct. That is the ambient room temperature. With that working, we can get our light bulb, stick it inside, and start the test. We turned off the light so you can see when the heating bulb turns on. It looks like the temperature reading is much easier to see now that we dim the room light. We left it like this for about 18 minutes until we started to notice some smoke coming out of the box which was an immediate red flag as well as a sudden rise in temperature on one side. So for safety, we decided to pull the plug and investigate what happened. Now it does obviously feel hot but we wanted to ensure there is no active fire inside so we got the fire extinguisher ready and put on our safety glasses. As we lift the box, it's clear that the 3D prints have melted and we're dealing with a gooey mess. You can see that both plastic sides were damaged by the heat and that the cardboard shreds are clearly flammable. However, we decided to completely redesign the box, this time using metal dividers. The way this design works is simple. When we put these two on top of each other, you can see that the red wants to drop in, so we prop it up with a rod. You can see that this red box is now elevated in the air, which means that we have a gap down below here for the plaster of pears to seep into. The issue is, if you look at it from the top, it can still slide side to side. To center it, we have another hole where we slide in a thinner rod for support. Now you can see that it's perfectly constrained in the center, so we're ready to add the plaster of Paris. To ensure a completely filled base, we pour the mixture directly into the blue box and then place the red box on top of it. You can see that it's sitting above, so we insert the two rods, and same as last time, we use the funnel to pour the plaster, top it up, and level it off. Once it hardens, we use the hand scraper to level off the top, and we removed both rods. The next step is to remove the red box from the inside. You can see that the plastic is naturally peeling off already, but pulling too hard can cause the plaster to chip and crack. So, to avoid the cracking, we're going to heat up a utility knife with a torch and burn through the plastic to remove it section by section. However, we found this rather inefficient, so we changed our technique to directly torching the plastic near a ventilation system and then peeling it with a plier while it's hot. This worked well and we managed to eventually remove the red plastic in one piece. With that all done, we can insert our new metal dividers to form our three chambers. Now we want to measure the temperature of this chamber and this chamber, so let's quickly add the thermocouples, followed by the metal dividers, and there's our new experiment box. On one side, we insert our fiberglass insulation, while on the other side, we insert our homemade cardboard shreds, and lastly, we put the light bulb in place. So we turned everything on and placed the thermocouple in position. You can see the heating chamber is starting to heat up. Also, notice that our light bulb here started to flash. That's not a fault, it's just the PID temperature controller getting closer to its set temperature, so it starts pulsing the heating element, which is our light bulb. We also used our thermal camera to see if there's any noticeable temperature differences between the two sides, but they were very similar. Eventually, the heating chamber reached the desired temperature of 150 degrees and each of our test compartments reached an equilibrium, with the cardboard insulation reading 40 degrees, while the fiberglass insulation read a slightly lower temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. With these numbers, we're now able to calculate the R value of our homemade cardboard insulation using this formula. So here are the values of these variables. The first is Q, the power of the bulb, which in this case is 5 watts. But why 5 if the bulb is 40 watts? Since the light, or energy, is dissipated into 6 walls in the box, we can estimate that only around 7 watts actually make it to our insulation. So why did we choose 5 watts? Well, because our duty cycle at equilibrium was 80%, which is easily measured in the video by calculating the time the light was on versus the length of time it was off. With the light emitting for only 80% of the time, we take 80% of 6.6 .6 to get roughly 5.3 watts. The last 0.3 watts we blame on natural inefficiencies as you can see in the infrared camera, which shows that the chamber is losing heat to the environment. It's not a lot, you can see that it's the same temperature as my body, but we still estimated it to be around 0.3 watts. Hence, we estimate that our Q value is 5 watts. Next is A, which is the area of the insulation as calculated by our CAD model, along with D, the thickness of the insulation, which is 5 centimeters. The last variable is change in temperature, delta T, 
which is the difference between the temperature measured behind our insulation and the temperature measured inside the heat source chamber. Notice that we're calculating the R value for our fiberglass insulation first, which is used as the control for our experiment. In other words, since the R value of this insulation is known, we can confirm that our calculations are correct before applying them to our homemade insulation. The packaging claimed an R value of 3.16, while the R value we calculated is 0.565. So why are we so off? Well, we're not. We're actually bang on. We got 0.565 using metric units. If we take 2 seconds to convert this on Wolfram Alpha to Imperial units, we get a value of 3.2. This is incredibly close to the actual R value, which validates our method. So now we can apply this exact same method to our homemade cardboard insulation. The only value that changes in this equation is the change in temperature to 110 degrees, derived by simply subtracting 40 from 150, which gives us a total R value in Imperial units of 3.1. Although the R value of our homemade cardboard insulation is slightly worse than the store-bought fiberglass insulation, we still want to proceed with trying to insulate our garage attic to see if it's possible. Just note, we do not recommend using cardboard as insulation since it's flammable, and fiberglass insulation is easily accessible and cheap. That said, we will be showing an interesting method to make cardboard less flammable later in the video, so stay tuned. We managed to fill up four full large plastic bags with cardboard that we're going to place in the attic up there. While Alan ties these bags, we do want to share a quick sneak peek of one of our big upcoming videos. It's a CNC lathe with an automatic tool changer. It's an absolute beast, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on that. With all the bags tied up, it was time to get them all up to the attic. Luckily, we had a high enough ladder to safely reach the top. One by one, we carried each bag up until all of them were in place. They fit quite nicely on the ceiling panels between each of the studs, however, the attic is so large that we deem this was not a practical way to insulate a house. The combination of a lower R value, fire hazard, and inefficient process led us to the conclusion that we should just stick to store-bought insulation, so we got those bags out of the garage. Nonetheless, this was an extremely fun project for us to do using Shreddy 5, and the insulation can still be used for future projects that are not concerned with fire hazards. Now for the sake of science, we wanted to explore how to make cardboard non-flammable. We first needed a pot, safety gloves, and some boiling water. We poured the water into the pot and then added in some boric acid. Now, the quantities of this powder does matter and there are suggestions online, but for the sake of this short experiment, we'll just use an amount we deem appropriate. Then we give it a good mix until it dissolves and the lumps disappear. Next, we take two small pieces of cardboard. The one on the right is going to be our control and the one on the left will be our sample. We're going to let it soak in the solution for about 5 minutes. When done, we can take the cardboard out of the water and let it dry for about 24 hours. Once dry, we're going to light both of these on fire and see if our experiment piece burns less than our control. After a day, we were ready to test. For better visuals, we mounted these parts on 3D printed supports and got straight to lighting them on fire. Immediately, you can start to see that the control catches on fire, while the flame on the strip covered in the boric acid solution is hesitant to start. It also goes out rather fast, you can tell that the experiment piece is clearly less flammable. It was painful to try to light it, so to push the boundaries we brought out a torch. Despite the experiment catching on fire, the flame went out on its own, while the control was basically ashes and still burning. Not bad for cardboard exposed to a propane torch. Although this was not fireproof, our experiment clearly worked. This was a fun project, and bigger ones are coming out soon, so make sure to subscribe, and we'll see you next time.